Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeff Simon. I'm here from Social Flight Live. We have a great program for you this evening. John Herman is here, Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Tempest Aero Group, and also Mike Bush, CEO of Savvy Aviation, and probably the best known AMP and IA in general aviation. So a really great program to get to tonight. And I'd like to also begin by telling you a little bit about what's going on here with Social Flight's Takeoffs for Takeout program. Now, Social Flight and Social Flight Live, our program this evening, are dedicated to supporting general aviation, especially during this very challenging time for everyone, and especially for a very vulnerable industry such as general aviation. And so we're doing everything that we can to help promote safe social distancing flying, help the industry as well as all of you be able to fly safely and motivate you to get out there, make investments in your aircraft, do whatever we can so that we are protecting ourselves and our industry so that when this is all over, it is there better or at least as good as it was before. And so we'd like to start uh, with uh, a couple things that have been sent in by viewers. Um, one of the things that uh, here was uh, sent in a trip by one of our viewers, EA Chapter 216 at 17 November, Cross Keys in Monroe Township, New Jersey. Uh, some great information. They uh, have, uh, are hosting on the 6th of June a hoagie fly-in and takeout event, all designed for safe social distancing. Man, a hoagie, bottle of water, bag of chips for five bucks, you can't beat that. I'd just like to feature that event. It's just a great example of people getting together to support general aviation during this time. Another thing that I'd like to talk about is our current winner of our Takeoffs for Takeout. Uh, we have uh, a new winner that is Chad Haas of Orlando, Florida. Uh, Chad has sent us in his stories of flying and uh, the things that he has been doing, visiting different places uh, during this, and uh, again, helping to support all those businesses. And Chad was the winner of a Bose A20 headset. Thanks so much to Bose for that. And so continue to send us your stories and things happening along there. Um, I wanted to share a trip that I personally took over the weekend. Uh, Heidi and I took a trip. We went out uh, to Provincetown. And uh, one of the nice things during this trip, first, we started here at Minuteman, our base airport, 6 Bravo 6 in Stowe, Massachusetts. We got to see this absolutely gorgeous 195, you can see there, uh, as it was fueling up and we were taxiing out. We got routed directly over Logan Airport, as you can see. It was sad, of course, to see that, that uh, there was no uh, traffic happening right below us at, at Logan, but uh, the controller did treat us to a, a flyby by a 787 that was inbound, the only traffic happening, and uh, he brought the, the, uh, our path and the other uh, aircraft uh, were about a thousand foot altitude apart, and, um, uh, and, and it was really uh, a, a pretty cool trip. And so we went from there over to Provincetown, uh, as you can see here, got our bikes out and went and explored and supported the, uh, uh, the local businesses there and uh, were able to keep our proficiency up in the, in the process. So uh, that was a lot of fun. And then the last thing I'd like to share with you this evening, it's kind of a, a fun little thing. Um, you can certainly see over my shoulder here, of course, our project continues to grow uh, and our T-51 Mustang build. You can follow that uh, on here on our social flight uh, channel on YouTube. And I uh, had a really fun uh, little uh, birthday present that came from uh, one of my uh, boys. Um, you know, when you build an experimental aircraft, a, a metal one, you spend an inordinate amount of time of your life with uh, these little guys, which are called Clicos. And uh, these guys have Clico clamps, very similar. Awful lot. Well, we also have a 3D printer here. And uh, I was surprised today by slightly larger versions of each of these um, made by Ben on our uh, 3D printer. And uh, it, it's, it's a, a lot of fun to see the, uh, the real thing and the difference there. So just wanted to share that quickly with you. So thank you so much for joining us. And I'd like to get right into our program now. We're going to start with John Herman. Let me uh, bring John online here. And um, John is Vice President of Sales and Marketing for Tempest Aero Group. He started his general aviation career in 1978 working for a local FBO in Anchorage, Alaska, of all places. 
Throughout his career, he's held sales and marketing positions for several companies, including Unison Industries, Superior Airports, Airports, excuse me, and Champion Aerospace. His career has given him the opportunity to live in Anchorage, Rockford, Illinois, Dallas, Texas, and now Atlanta, Georgia. John currently serves on several nonprofit boards, including the Southeastern Brain Tumor Foundation and Aviation Distributors and Manufacturers Association, where he's been an active uh, member of that organization since 83 and has served as marketing committee chair several terms and on the board of directors. He's currently vice president. He lives in Noonan, Georgia with his wife, Arlene. They have four grown children and grandchildren to boot. And I would just like to welcome John, please, uh, and uh, tell you a little bit about uh, our experience and my experience, of course, uh, with Tempest. How are you doing, John? Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for having me, and uh, we really appreciate everything that Social Flight's doing to to keep us all together with these uh, webinars in this uh, time when we're not able to get together in a normal way. So thank you for that. Oh, you're, you're very welcome, and I appreciate you joining us. Now, I uh, you know uh, I've known you for a long time, and I've known Tempest Products for a very long time, and uh, I have always been. Uh, both impressed and, and to be very frank, uh, grateful for the innovation that, that, that you have done. And for those uh, people in the audience, just to kind of give them a sense, give you a sense of, of this, you know, when we think about innovation in general aviation and in, uh, in technology, a lot of times we think about things like avionics, uh, maybe a new aircraft that comes along. Um, and so for a company to make the investment in core products, things like spark plugs, oil filters, vacuum pumps, um, f f parts for carburetors. That takes uh, an, an inordinate amount of, of risk, of business acumen, of investment dollars. I mean, you, you, you do a lot and you're dealing with these kind of, uh, some people might view them as kind of old technology products and making investments. Um, tell us a little bit about what, what drives that? How do you get a, a culture of that kind of investment in these type of products? Yeah, that's a very good question because um, you're, you're right. Uh, the products that we manufacture are not um, um, real flashy and, and uh, they don't have a lot of bells and whistles and lights and so on. And, and uh, so to design innovation into something such as an oil filter or a spark plug, uh, takes a, a real passion at, at the core. And what I mean by that is Tim Henderson, the gentleman that actually founded our company back in the early 80s at, under Aero Accessories, had, is still with us today, and he is the chief engineering mind behind everything that we do. And Tim has always... Uh, had the the drive and the passion for building things better. Uh, he he doesn't want to build it the way it's always been done. He looks at at a product, whatever that product may be, and uh, looks at it from the standpoint of how can we how can we build this better? Uh, how can we build it in such a way that it gives customers what they're looking for in terms of, of value for the product? Uh, in terms of uh, longevity of the product and in terms of customer support. So with Tim still being involved in the business, uh, everybody at our company is committed to uh, building quality products and, and always looking to see how can, we, how can we build it better, regardless of what the product is. And you so, guys have very much done that. I mean, if we look at the type of products that, uh, just to name name a few, uh, that I've I've written about for you know AOPA and for others that we've written and and promoted through uh, the other work that we've done. I mean, we're talking about things like uh, fired in uh, solid core resistors and spark plugs instead of you know the types that can can you know disintegrate over time and and cause other issues. You've done innovative products having to do with measuring spark plug resistance to know what the quality is of those. Uh, oil filter gaskets that don't need to be lubricated. Um, wear indicator port on, uh, on vacuum pumps so we can tell before a vacuum pump actually fails. And, and of course, like these new style uh, floats so that we don't have to worry about all these things that have happened in the past with carburetor floats eventually kind of 
uh, filling up with with uh, fuel and stopping working properly. And those those are things that it's very easy, I think, for mechanics uh, and for aviation uh, for aircraft owners and consumers to view as kind of commodities and just maybe pick what the cheapest is. Somehow you've managed in many cases to do both. Yeah, and I think a lot of, uh, a lot of importance comes with, um, the, or the importance of listening to our customers as well. Um, you know, we, we're a manufacturer and we make a lot of different products. We work very, very hard to make sure that we put out the best product we possibly can. Does that mean that, that we don't occasionally have a problem? Absolutely, We're, every manufacturer does. But I think by listening to our customers and evaluating when a customer comes to us with a complaint about something, uh, we, we really take a good look at it and say, okay, is there something that we could do better uh, to improve the product? And that could, you know, that could even be uh, something as, as, for instance, our spark plugs, our, um, are nickel plated, and uh, when we when we bought that line from Unison, uh, there was an issue with the cracking around the the nickel as we put the plug together because nickel is very brittle. We we didn't that wasn't satisfactory to us, and so we have improved not only the process for um, plating uh, the plugs, but also the nickel material that we're using as well. So even things such as cosmetic issues are very important to us. And uh, I think a, a company has to be committed to constantly improving if they, wanna, if they want to uh, be progressive and maintain their, their uh, place in the market. Right, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think the, the other thing that you touched on, which I think is interesting, and, and I think it's interesting for people who are listening to consider in terms of communicating directly with you and providing feedback is, it, it seems to me by viewing some of the uh, products that you've come out with uh, over the years, some of which are core products and some of which are tools or, uh, or products to actually kind of analyze and measure, whether it be spark plug resistance or, or tools to work on things, it, it seems to me that, um, that there's a good feedback loop to be had where when you get even like, let's say, difficulty reports from the field, Sometimes the product answer can be in improving the product, and sometimes the product answer can be in helping the end user with the maintenance of the product. Absolutely, and, and uh, we are a big, big believer in education um, and educating our customers and educating ourselves through feedback from our customers. So, um, you know, probably in a, in a 12 month period, uh, we conduct at least 25 or 30 different uh, IA seminars. Uh, we do so, well. We had a seminar on on social flight last week on um, carburetors and fuel injection systems. So we're a big believer in in being out amongst our customers, uh, whether whether it's a pilot owner uh, doing the maintenance that he's allowed to do, or whether it's an AMP or an IA. Uh, we want to be out there. We want to participate with them and educate them. Um, Mike Bush, for instance, you're going to have him on here in just a few minutes. And, and I've sat in on several of Mike's uh, presentations. And we, we work together on things so that the message that's being uh, presented to the, uh, to the pilot owner and the AMP is accurate and it's consistent with what we see as a manufacturer. Right, and that, um, so let's take an example of one of those things. I mean, uh, I've, I've personally experienced some, some issues when helping people with their aircraft maintenance where uh, a, a spark plug, for example, a single spark plug with a very high resistance can actually do a lot of damage upstream in the magneto uh, with the points and cause uh, really, cause some damage to your magneto that, that requires a lot of maintenance dollars when the end problem is the plug itself. And one of the things that, uh, are, uh, that I saw obviously that you've come out with is uh, a way to measure that in a go, no go gauge and really promoted pretty heavily the issue of testing the resistance value of spark plugs 
in order to protect uh, no one to change them, but also in order uh, to protect the system itself. Yeah, for many years, um, resistance was not really a maintenance uh, checklist item uh, on spark plugs. And uh, although there has been a, a mil spec written way back in the 60s that called out um, what the spec was for resistance in a uh, aviation spark plug and how that resistance was to be measured and so on, but it was never practiced. And so several years ago, when we designed uh, into the plug, the, the FIS, the fired in suppressed resistor, um, we realized the importance of controlling the resistance through the plug so that we didn't have that resistance drift, uh, causing a problem with the energy uh, getting to the business end of the spark plug. And we all know that energy's got to go somewhere. And if it can't get to where it needs to go, it causes problems within the magneto, harness leads, uh, the, the barrel end of the spark plug, and so on. And it was really sort of uh, amazing to us the, the number of customers that we had that we talked to that said they, they just had an issue. The engine was running rough. They couldn't figure out why. Uh, they had spent a lot of money replacing magnetos and harnesses and fuel controls and all kinds of stuff, when in reality, they had spark plugs that had very, very high resistance in them. And just by recognizing that, uh, taking an ohmmeter and checking the resistance in the plug uh, and taking the plugs out that exceeded 5,000 ohms, it solved their problem. So one of the, and you mentioned earlier tools. So one of the things that we look at doing as well is we don't really want to be the manufacturer that is a tool manufacturer, so to speak. But occasionally we find a need because there is no specific tool to do the job. Well, for a pilot owner to take an ohm meter and check the resistance in, you know, a dozen spark plugs, that's not, uh, uh, too cumbersome a task, but to ask a flight school or a fleet operator who's who's maintaining spark uh, hundreds of spark plugs at a time uh, to put an ohm meter on a spark plug is is really difficult to do that many. So uh, Tim Henderson, the gentleman I, I mentioned earlier, um, went to work and designed a tool, our AT5K tester that that automates that process. It, it makes it very easy to put um, the harness barrel end of the plug down on the contact, touch the lead wire to the firing end, and you get a green or a red light. And right. it tells you whether that plug is, is over 5,000 ohms of resistance or not. Now, when you do that, you want to make sure that the plug is clean. You don't want to pull it right out of the end with carbon buildup on the electrodes and so on. You want to you know, clean the carbon off so you're getting good contact. But that tool has really simplified uh, the process for checking resistance. And it has, by, by checking resistance and checking the spark value in a, in a spark tester, it's really reduced a lot of ignition problems, rough running engine problems for a lot of people. Now, can you explain the procedure when you're using an ohmmeter, how exactly, uh, it, for people who don't have that tool, how they should be testing a plug? Sure. I mean, it, you know, multimeter, you want to make sure you've got it set to the right setting, right? So you want to uh, set it to check resistance. And really, it's very simple. Uh, some ohmmeters, uh, I've noticed you have to, uh, because the barrel is so deep in the harness end of the plug, that you have to kind of carve away the little plastic lip so you can get the electrode all the way down into the into the plug. But right. you just simply take one end and put it down in the barrel end of the plug, which is where the harness would normally attach, and clean off the uh, firing end electrode, and you want to touch the other lead to the, uh, to the center electrode of right. the spark plug. And just make sure that you're accurately reading it. Sometimes we'll get somebody that will call us and say, you know, I found that, uh, you know, the plug has some astronomical uh, high resistance and uh, come to find out they've got the setting wrong on the multimeter or they're not reading it properly. So you just have to 
kind of uh, know the meter that you're using and know how, how to read it, right. but that's simply the process for it. So you basically just need to, you need to have a, a probe that's long enough. So what you're doing is you're taking off the harness, you're going down into the barrel to the center where that uh, spring from your harness actually hits. You want a clean contact there, and then you're going down to the center of the electrode where it goes into the engine. And that's where that resistance exists that we want to make sure that we're actually measuring. Is that correct? That's correct. You're basically measuring the um, the resistance that exists through, because there is a resistor in every spark plug. Uh, every aviation spark plug has a resistor built in it, and and the reason for that is to uh, maintain the service life on the plug because otherwise the energy capability from the magneto uh, will put up far more energy than the plug needs. So right. there is a resistor in the plug, and you want to have at least 500 ohms of resistance on the on the the low side and a maximum of 5,000 ohms. Okay. And, you know, right. does, it mean that does it, temperature matter? I'm sorry? Does temperature matter? Yeah, so um, when you're measuring that, the spec calls out at, at you know, normal uh, room temperature and uh, pressure and so on. When you put the plug in the, in the uh, pressure tester, the spark tester, that's where you get the simulated pressure. But the temperature is a really good example because we have, for instance, taken plugs that normally would spark well in a spark plug tester, didn't check the resistance. I mean, we did because we knew what it was, but resistance didn't matter. We tested the spark plug tester, got a nice, clean blue spark on it, and then we heated the barrel of the plug up um, to try and get it up to simulate what it might uh, what it might experience in an engine environment, and you can actually see the spark dissipate to the point where it just stops. Wow! So, so the, the, the and in that particular case, that plug had a, over a hundred thousand ohms of resistance. So it sort of illustrates the importance of not only checking the the strength of the spark through your normal spark tester, but checking it with an ohm meter to make sure that it's below 5,000 because in in the tests that have been done, if it's below 5,000, you're never going to, even regardless of how hot that plug gets, it's never going to increase to a point where it's going to affect the spark. But if you have a plug that looks good at room temperature, but it's got 100,000 ohms of resistance, it's probably not working at all or consistently in the in the engine environment with the heat and pressure and everything. Right. That makes sense. So basically 500 to 5,000 ohms is your safe range. Uh, you're testing what's going on in the center core uh, of your plug. Everything else is the, basically the ground and what's happening uh, around it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and that that's that's the bottom line of what you're generating for a spark there and what you're looking at. Um, that's now, correct. Um, <laughs> Now, there's a couple of other other areas. Uh, while I still have you, that uh, that that I've personally been involved in being able to see uh, a, a big change in maintenance. One of them has to do with being able to be really proactive with uh, vacuum pumps for those people that are still with vacuum pumps. Um, can you tell me a little bit about for folks that have your wear indicator port equipped uh, vacuum pumps, um, how they're measuring and what they're looking for and what guidelines to give people on when to, to change out a pump, especially if you fly hard IFR and uh, you're, you're concerned about it, or if you have an aircraft that's got boots on it, let's say, and those pumps are constantly running. Um, not, I'm sure uh, so there are some people out there that may not realize that if you have uh, boots on an aircraft, they're constantly being sucked down into the flat state by, uh, by the opposite side of the vacuum pump um, on a regular basis and then used on the pressure side to pump up. Um, so those pumps they get a lot of a lot of use. So, um, what advice can you give people having to do with uh, your pumps? Sure. So, um, first of all, let's talk about um, the difference very quickly. The difference between the pumps. We have what we call small and large pumps. The small pumps are the ones that typically operate on a single engine, let's say a single engine Cessna or something, and it it will operate um, two to three instruments. And that's essentially it. That's our 3200 series pump. And 
that pump you can typically see a thousand twelve hundred uh, hours of service life again that's um, that's not a hard and fast rule because we don't know the condition of the pneumatic system we don't know the condition of the hose in the pneumatic system that might be you know any kind of liner in the hose that might be chafing and so on could cause resistance uh, through the air through the line which makes the pump work harder and harder so when I say expect a thousand hours on that pump you may you could very easily get 1500 hours on that pump if you maintain it properly so that smaller pump has a visual inspection port in it it's called a wear indicator port and it's on the um, the opposite end of the drive end of the, of the pump and it does in most cases it requires that the pump be removed from the engine to do the the inspection uh, some applications you can you know you might be able to inspect it on the on the engine but in most cases you want to take the pump off uh, there's a little plug at the end of the uh, uh, at the end of the housing you remove that plug and you turn the pump so that the vein you'll see a little hole inside there and you'll see you'll be able to monitor the vein wear because the veins wear the length of the vein wears and it gets shorter and shorter and shorter and eventually um, there's not enough vein left inside the rotor of the pump to stabilize that vein and that's what cause, causes pumps to fail. So right. what the, the object is to get the pump off before the vein gets short enough that it's, it's going to cause that kind of a failure. So um, it's really best if you if you get on our website and look at the manual with all of the illustrations. But there's a visual inspection on the small pumps. You want to inspect that at 600 hours uh, for the first inspection. And once that vein starts to get short enough that it it starts to open up the hole inside the inspection port, then you want to inspect that pump every hundred hours after that. The reason for that is the diameter of that hole inside is a hundred thousandths of an inch and veins under normal wear conditions will wear 25 thousandths of an inch every hundred hours. So in theory at 600 hours within 400 hours that pump's going to be worn out. But right. again, you want to check it and see um, you might get far more hours out of it than a thousand hours. On the bigger pumps, which are the ones that you're referring to that, that operate boots and, and pressurization, cabin pressurization, and so on, they work very, very hard. And uh, typically, four to 600 hours is uh, an expected service life on those pumps. They also have an inspection port, but it's a little bit different. It's actually on the housing, on the outside of the pump, on the, on the diameter of the housing. And that pump is, uh, there's a plug that you remove. You can do this on the engine. You remove the plug and there's a little insert that you stick in and you have to turn, you know, you have to turn the prop just a bit to get the, the insert into the slot where the vein is in the pump. Yep. Uh, but you can measure the length of the vein with that uh, little measuring device. And again, once it's worn out and there's a mark on the tool that tells you when it's worn out, you want to get the pump off um, and uh, and replace it. And the other yep. thing that I'll just say quickly are, are the valves, the de-ice valves and regulators. Um, a lot a lot of times those are overlooked, and they really should be tested with a pneumatic test kit. Um, and we can uh, save that for another another presentation. But um, there's uh, they they should definitely be tested and looked at because. If the pressure regulator is malfunctioning and not working properly, it's going to wear that pump out much, much faster, and it's going to cause the, the pump to fail. That makes sense, definitely. And I'd like to remind everyone also that we do a, a series of presentations from Tempest. There'll be other webinars coming up. There's webinars on Social Flight's YouTube channel, and, and uh, as we uh, bring Mike Bush online, uh, to join us. I'm, I'm sure there's a ton of things that apply directly from uh, some of the technical issues that Mike presents about as well. Um, last point, John, uh, how are things going at Tempest and what are you hearing from our dealers uh, during the crisis? Yeah, good question. So uh, I, 
I was actually in Australia when all of this uh, broke back uh, in mid-March. And uh, I'll say that, um, that we managed the business in such a way that we were very proactive. Uh, we, of course, everybody, I say that everybody's COVID-19 crystal ball is opaque. Uh, nobody, nobody really knows uh, what the future holds, but we, we took the action that we felt that we needed to, to keep the business going, uh, to keep supporting general aviation. Yeah, it's been, it's been tough. I mean, there's no question that, um, you know, our, our year's not going to end up as we hoped that it would back in January, but, uh, we're doing very well. Uh, we're starting to see, um, my guys keep very close contact with the marketplace so that we can monitor the activity in the market and so on. And we're starting to see things, you know, taking place, movement happening at some of the flight schools. They're getting the airplanes, um, you know, maintained back in th through maintenance and so on to get them ready and prep for flight training and that type of thing. And um, so we, we, we're we optimistic. I mean, we, we really feel that, um, it's going to take some time. We don't know how long, uh, but uh, I personally feel good about general aviation. I think it's I think it's going to come back. And I love when I go out and stand in my backyard and I see airplanes flying over all the time and a lot of activity. So um, yeah. and associations like yours really help to keep you know keep people interested in aviation and proficient and so on. Well, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to come on Social Flight Live tonight, and uh, we're going to bring Mike Bush on board uh, now. And and I just, you know, it is so great to hear that uh, not only the the story of investment and the technology that you've done coming up, but also the fact that you're weathering the storm well. And uh, I, I hate it when I hear stories from friends and others of some of the companies that are going through really tough times letting people go and ultimately really uh, having a, a negative impact on the industry. And the fact that you uh, at Tempest have been able to get through this without that is, is something I am deeply appreciative for to, and, and to any company that can make that happen and continue to support our, our industry. So thanks very much to that. And again, for everyone, if you are uh, on Social Flight and a member of socialflight.com, completely free, um, that will get you all the information of upcoming very detailed technical webinars, giving you information about all these different topics where we just do a deep dive into the technology aspect of that. So John, thank you so much very much. Uh, I am going to bring uh, Mike Bush on now. Now, Mike, everybody knows if you are even alive with a pulse in general aviation and in maintenance, you know the name Mike Bush. He's CEO of Savvy Aviation. Um, arguably the best known AMP and IA in general aviation. He writes the monthly savvy maintenance column for AOPA Pilot, hosts free monthly maintenance webinars at EAA, writes articles all over the place. Mike co-founded AvWeb, believe it or not, back in 1995 and served as editor-in-chief until 2002. His work over the years as a type club technical representative for the Cessna Pilots Association, the American Bonanza Society, the Cirrus Pilots, uh, Owners and Pilots Association, have made him an asset for aircraft owners around the world. Mike formed Savvy Aviation back in 2008 to provide aircraft maintenance management and consulting services to thousands of aircraft owners. And that includes pre-buy management, innovative engine monitor analysis, and 24-7 breakdown assistance that's essentially AAA for general aviation. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that and some very important stuff that he's done uh, uh, during this crisis to help us as well. Uh, he's authored uh, hundreds of articles, four books, uh, and has been honored as a National Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year by the FAA Administrator in 2008, a pilot and aircraft owner for more than 55 years. I'm not going to let anyone do the math on that one. I'm sure he started at five <laughs> years old with over 8,000 hours logged commercial, single, multi-engine, seaplane rating, glider rating, CFII, and of course, AMP and IA. Welcome, Mike Bush. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. That's a hell of a resume, that, man. That, that was quite an introduction. Uh, you were killing <laughs> me. I, I just I was, I was, just wanted to jump in on this conversation with John all this time, and I, I you had me off, so, because uh, I, because uh, the stuff that John was talking about triggered all sorts of thoughts in my mind, so maybe we can talk a little bit about 
about spark plugs and vacuum pumps and things like that. Oh, let's let's dive into it. I'd like to start with one thing in particular, and that is one. You know, I've followed you for years. I'm an AMP and IA as well, and very, uh, you know, very, very just love aviation education. And um, one of the things that I really have enjoyed that you have been a champion of uh, is condition-based maintenance. This idea that we don't that, that we're careful and thoughtful about what we disturb that is working and careful and thoughtful about how we see trends about what might not be working. So I'd like to lead off with that and hear a little bit about that, maybe how that ties into the things John was talking about. Well, it definitely does. I, I'm a big fan of condition-based maintenance. I hate to see hardware retired before its time. Um, the um, uh, This is a lesson I, I actually wrote about it pretty extensively in my first book, which is called Manifesto. It's a little hundred page book that you can read on in one session on the toilet if you want to. And it, it goes into uh, the, the, this, this philosophy and it talks about the history uh, back from the days in World War II when, when uh, uh, a guy named Professor C.H. Waddington kind of discovered that the less preventive maintenance we do on these airplanes, the more reliable they become. And then in the late 60s, th this piece of wisdom was rediscovered independently at, at uh, United Airlines uh, by a couple of scientists there named uh, Stan Nolan and Howard Heap. And they basically revolutionized the way maintenance was done in the airline industry. Uh, this philosophy of reliability-centered maintenance or condition-based maintenance uh, propagated to, um, uh, to the military. Um, it's now been picked up by all sorts of non-aviation industries that are that are safety critical and, and maintenance intensive. And uh, you know, one of my missions for the last 20 years has been to try to drag owner-flown general aviation kicking and screaming into this new way of doing things that everybody else has been doing for decades now. Um, but this whole business about overhauling engines at TBO and things, things like that uh, are, are just, it's a very old fashioned way of thinking. And right. um, we try very hard to discourage our clients from, from, from uh, doing maintenance that, that where, where there's no clear reason for doing it. Um, you know, I fly a, a Cessna Turbo 310. Um, the engines on my airplane are, are uh, have a published TBO of 1,400 hours. Um, I took the engines to 3,200 hours. I majored the right one. I topped the left one. It's still trucking uh, because in the course of topping it, I I pulled off the connecting rods, got a good look at the at the crankshaft, and it was in beautiful condition. And I took a look at the connecting rod big end bearings, and they were in beautiful condition. And I figured, well, if they're in beautiful condition, then the main bearings, which are stressed a lot less than the rod bearings, are going to be in beautiful condition. So why would I turn to tear down a perfectly good engine just because it was 3,200 hours, you know, two and a half times TBO or whatever that works out to be? Um, you know, the the when when John was talking about the vacuum pumps, I, I you know I've got two two of what he calls the big pumps, the 400 series pumps on my. 310, they're the ones that, that that keep the boots sucked down all the time and so on. And I have an awful lot of experience. I've owned this airplane for 32 years, and so I've got a lot of experience with vacuum pumps. Um, and one of the basic principles of reliability center maintenance is, the, is, is to look at failures and to ter determine what the consequences of the failures are. And it turns out that most equipment failures in aircraft have acceptable consequences because we have redundancy typically. So, so for example, a failure of a number two comm radio is not going to ruin your day. You know, it's probably not going to cancel your trip. It's just something you deal with when you get home. Well, you know, I got two vacuum pumps on my 310. And the failure of one vacuum pump is an acceptable failure because the remaining pump will run all the systems. And so one of the basic principles of reliability-centered maintenance is that if a failure is acceptable, then there's no reason to try to prevent it with preventive maintenance. So I don't use those inspection ports, John. I'm sorry. I run the pumps to failure. 
because that's what RCM says to do. It says if it's ex acceptable failure, run it to failure. And I do. Now, I always carry a spare pump in the wing locker. And I, uh, and I always carry like that little trick wrench that you need to get the one uh, uh, nut that's really, really hard to get to. Uh -huh. And I've, I, and I've been, regardless. <laughs> and I've and I've been known to change vacuum pumps in the most god awful places, you know, out on the ramp and stuff like that. I'm pretty good at changing vacuum pumps now, but I run those suckers to failure. They're they're expensive. So and let, let's why not get every every possible hour out of them? So let's let's talk about one that comes up from everybody all the time, and that's overhauls. And you mentioned um, uh, uh -huh. how you were running yours, uh, and and. Uh, you know, I remember a similar experience with a, a, a Lycoming engine on a Grumman I had many, many years ago where same thing. I, I was a new owner at the time and, and just getting uh, trained as far as A&P. And, um, uh, you know, I thought the number mattered a lot as far as the uh, the overhaul. And, um, and I remember getting the report back from the folks who did the overhaul at the time, again, going back a long time ago, it's basically saying, hey, good news, you know. Everything was in spec. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was in. that was my experience, Jeff. I mean, when I started off, I, I, you know, had had drunk the TBO Kool Aid like everybody else, and you know, I sort of believe that you're supposed to do that sort of thing. And so when the uh, when when the engines on my 310 got to TBO the first time, I asked some friends that that were very maintenance knowledgeable this is back before i was an anp or anything and 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 said my engines are tbo what should i do and they said well is there anything wrong with them and i said no and they said well then keep on flying so i kept on flying and i got progressively more and more nervous because i just you know i somehow i figured i'm i'm skating on thinner and thinner ice as i go further and further over tbo that was that was uh, my right. belief at the time. So I got to 500 hours over TBO and I was getting really, really nervous. So I decided to tear the engines down. And I sent them off to a really good engine shop. And I said, you know, after you get the engines all torn apart, you get all of the measurements done and so on, before you start building the engines back up, give me a call when I come down and survey the damage. And I had exactly the same experience you did. The engines were 500 hours over TBO and everything was was I mean all the cylinders were still within new limits if you can believe that not service limits but new limits it was amazing there was nothing wrong with those engines that was like a watershed experience for me you know fascinating I, I, and, and, and so, so then I I just started saying you know this this is not the right way to do things um, and that was before I discovered uh, all of the research that had been done you know it. At United Airlines and and back in World War II, th this was just sort of independently uh, came to, and then I discovered there are a lot of other people who figured this out long before I did. So, what are Mike like? What are your your big list items if you were going to say the things that you do watch that are big issues with an engine? If we're focusing on on the the core and the the engine the engine the cylinders the bottom end top et cetera. Um, I mean, obviously, exhaust valves have gotten so much attention. You've written a lot about it. They're an area. Right. Can you can you kind of list off what you think the hot spots are for things? Well, that let, let's let's just let's just talk about what what you just brought up because it's a perfect example of uh, exhaust valves are a significant problem, and um, and we we've gotten much better at but back when I got started. Uh, we swallowed valves on, with, with some regularity because all we all we did was use compression testing, which is a terrible way of of monitoring exhaust valves. And now, with with the fairly wide acceptance of borescopes, uh, with digital engine monitors and stuff, we can we we there, there's pretty much no excuse for an exhaust valve failing because we we can always catch it before it fails. But the point is, if an exhaust valve goes south. That, that's not something you would ever overhaul an engine for. Um, nothing that has anything to do with a cylinder is anything you'd ever overhaul an engine for because cylinders are bolt-on accessories. You know, if, 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 if a vacuum pump failed and somebody said, oh, the vacuum pump failed, you're going to have to overhaul the engine, that wouldn't pass the laugh test, would it? You know, because it's held on by, by, by four nuts. You know, you don't overhaul engines because vacuum pumps fail. 
Well, cylinders are the same way. They're bolt-on accessories. Any, nothing that happens to cylinders, high oil consumption, swallowed exhaust valves, um, you know, even a, a broken ring that, 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 that puts a bunch of metal in the oil filter, you, you wouldn't overhaul an engine for that because you, you unbolt the cylinder and you repair it or you replace it and, and, and you're back in business. You wouldn't pull the, 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 the uh, engine out of the airplane for that. So the only reason we should ever overhaul an engine is because it develops some bottom end problem that we can't rectify without splitting the case. Okay. And even then, it's not clear that an overhaul is the right thing to do. Um, it, it, may, it may be that, that just an IRAN is, is all you need to do. It just it depends. When, when people ask me, they have, let's say, a bunch, bunch of metal in the oil filter and the, the, or, or a prop strike or something, and they have to, they have to uh, send the engine off to split the case and say, you know, should I, should I major the engine? I said, don't, don't decide that now. Send, send it off, have them split the case, get everything measured, see what you got, and then decide whether, you, whether, whether it's worth uh, turning it into an overhaul or not. So let's make sure there's a, let me, I want to make a clear distinction on something that you've said there and make sure it's clear for everyone because when you mm -hmm. do have issues that can cause contamination in the uh, engine, when there's a swallow, you mentioned broken ring, swallowed a, a exhaust valve, anything else that can do that. Yes. Uh, you certainly, I would imagine, you would recommend that you've got to trace down um, where that foreign material has gone to make sure your engine. I right. Think well, this is crazy. another thing that overhaul. so many, so many ANPs are are spring loaded to. If there's any metal in the filter, we have to tear down the engine, which is just a, just terrible. If you think about how these engines are built, um, the the if, if metal gets into the in, in, into the um, the oil sump. It, it first has to go through a suction screen. That The suction screen is there to get rid of all of the big stuff, the stuff with serial numbers on it, so it won't go through the oil pump and, 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 and damage it. So anything larger than, say, a sixteenth of an inch in diameter gets caught in the oil screen, never even gets ingested to the pump. Um, smaller stuff will, will, that gets through that screen goes, goes through the oil pump, and oil pumps are, are pretty bulletproof and then winds up going through um, an oil filter. The oil filter filters out pretty much everything down to about 50 microns, and anything that gets through the filter isn't, isn't harmful. It, it circulates harmlessly in the engine. So the only time we would ever have to worry about contamination is if there is so much metal in the oil filter that the oil filter is clogged and goes into bypass. And and that very seldom happens. But if we're nervous about that, we can check that a couple of different ways. Uh, one thing that we often do, if if there's some question about whether uh, any metal got past the filter and got into the oil galleries and, and, and possibly might have contaminated bearings, a very simple thing to do is to pull the prop governor and to take a look at the prop governor gasket screen, which is at the extreme opposite end of of the right. the oil system from from the from the pump and the filter, and if there's any metal in that screen, then you know it got into the galleries and and it's teardown time. Right. If the screen and is the clean, we need some work too. <laughs> yeah, if the screen is clean, um, that the chances are, you know, that that nothing got into the oil system and nothing's contaminated. But if you're like super super nervous. And you have to be really paranoid to go to this extent. You you can pull a cylinder and pull a connecting rod, and take a look at that bearing. And that bearing is a proxy for all the other bearings. Hmm. If you know if that bearing is is clean of contamination, um, then you then you can be darn sure that all the other bearings are clean of contamination because they're all getting their oil from the same place. So what and in does, fact, when I, when I overhauled the engine, um, uh, my, my right engine, I, I actually had a, a freak failure of a piston. Uh, it turned out that this piston had been manufactured with, uh, with an inclusion in the, in the forging, which means an air bubble got in. And that inclusion uh, wound up being the nucleus of a fatigue failure. And this piston shed a, 
a, a chunk of the skirt that part mm -hmm. down below the, 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 yeah. from the scraper ring on down about halfway around the piston. Uh, that thing then tangled with the, uh, uh, with the crankshaft got busted up into a whole bunch of pieces about the size of marbles and, uh, and filled the, the, the crankcase. Um, even after that, I wasn't a hundred percent sure that I was going to overhaul that engine. But what I did was I, I pulled connecting rods and I sent them out and they looked okay visually, but I sent them out for microscopic examination and they found some microscopic um, flakes of, of aluminum embedded in the, uh, in the bearings. Now the bearings have a, they're built to, with a fair amount of what's called embeddability. That is they're designed that they can hold a certain amount of contamination and still function well as bearings. But I decided that since there was some aluminum contamination, the bearings, the, the, the better part of valor would be to tear down the engine. But it was a close call. Right. And the other, and the other engine, which had six pistons out of the very same batch of pistons, I sort of decided, I don't think I want these pistons anymore. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if one of them let go, you know, the, 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 uh, the other 11 probably I, I ought to get rid of. So I did a, a heavy top overhaul on the other engine and I, I uh, had all the connecting rods removed and rebushed because the, the, the small end bushings are getting a little sloppy. But, you know, the crankshaft looked great. The bearings, the big end bearings looked great. So I, I put it back together. I, I just don't see any reason to tear a perfectly good engine down unless there's some good reason. So on a on an engine that has not had a failure uh, that we're dealing with, we're not doing any forensics after a failure on. What mm -hmm. what would you kind of list, kind of in some type of order, the the major things that you're going to be focused on with reliability centered maintenance in 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 keeping track of in the it, for someone who is concern night flying over inhospitable terrain and says to you what am i going to watch here to keep keep confident what are what's the top items well i i actually wrote an article and did a webinar called when to overhaul and, and if anybody wants to look it up the webinar is on my youtube channel and the articles uh, in in my archive on the yep. savvy aviation website but basically i gave a list of things that would prompt me to overhaul an engine let me let me be and, clear though, but I'm not speaking just to overhaul. I'm actually saying, if we put overhaul necessarily off the table, if we're literally just saying, what are you focused on on a, on a regular annual basis on that engine to feel confident in it, to be watching uh, confident in it, uh, putting the overhaul side uh, aside? Uh, what are your what are your big hit items to be watching? Well, I mean the 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 two big items um, as far as inspection are concerned. Uh, the the primary thing that we look at for the bottom end is a, a filter inspection um, and for light combings, a suction screen inspection because light combings have a removable suction screen. Continentals, unfortunately, don't, so we don't have a good way of inspecting it. But um, So those are the two big things that we use to determine bottom end condition. And the top end condition, the 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 most important thing is uh, is is four scope inspection of the cylinders. Mm -hmm. uh, secondary th thing that actually tells us an amazing amount is uh, analysis of engine monitor data in terms of what's going on in the in the top end. I mean, I th you think of the engine as as a hot section and a cold section, if you will, and and we need right. to we need to look at both of them. Problems with the hot section uh, don't require pulling the engine out of the airplane because the uh, all the cylinder assemblies are removable right. um the, what, what about oil analysis what are your thoughts on that um i believe in oil analysis but um there's a lot of misunderstanding about oil analysis you hear you hear a lot of people say well you know i had this that i had i you know i had a cam come apart and uh we got a whole bunch of metal in the oil filter and the oil analysis never saw it and so I don't believe in oil analysis. Well, that's just that, that's just a misunderstanding of what oil analysis is about. Oil analysis um, sees microscopic wear metal particles. It sees uh, sees wear metal metal particles that are so small that they can get through the oil filter. Um, 
the particles are so small that they're not doing any harm. So th there's nothing in an oil analysis report that would ever prompt me to tear down an engine. What hmm. oil analysis is good for is to give you an early warning about stuff that y you might find out quite a bit later about via other means and, and only after some damage has been done. For, so for example, when if a cam and lifter interface comes apart, that comes apart pretty darn fast and it throws off pretty big pieces of metal. And those big pieces of metal get caught in the oil filter and, and th that's how you, we typically find that, the, that a cam's coming apart is we see ferrous metal in the oil filter. And uh, you know, if it's me, then we send the oil filter out for scanning electron microscope analysis and it tells us what the alloy is and we say, oh, that's cam metal, we, you know, we got a problem. Um, that's never gonna show up in oil analysis. Because the, really? the, the the stuff that's being thrown off is too big. If right. it gets caught in the filter, it's not going to be in the jar, you know. Um, on the other hand, if we have accelerated uh, uh, wear of an, say an exhaust valve guide, that's a that, that that's a very very hard guide running on an extremely hard chrome plated valve stem. The wear rates on those things are very very slow compared to say the cam and lifter, and those throw off itty itty bitty tiny uh, particles of wear metal that are way too small to ever get caught in the filter. And even if they got caught in the filter, you couldn't see them unless you put the filter under a high powered microscope. So we never see that in the filter. The only way we're ever gonna see it is, is with oil analysis. And the oil analysis is gonna show that the nickel is very high. And unless we have nickel plated cylinders, the only place that nickel can be coming from is, is or, or the, the exhaust valve guides, which are made of a high nickel alloy. And Typically, we'll also see elevated chrome, which is what's on the valve stem, and we'll know that, you know, high nickel and high chrome mean that there's a there, there's a wear pattern on the uh, on on an exhaust valve and an exhaust valve guide. Now, the the oil analysis doesn't tell us which valve is the culprit, so now we got to pull out a bore scope and we got to take a look. And the best way to do that is to bore scope the cylinder while you're turning the prop and watching the valve open and close. And if the guide is worn, then what happens is as the, as the valve closes, it does a little sidestep as it goes into the seat. And that sidestep, you know, show, basically shows you the, that, that there's a fairly well-worn exhaust valve guide that's not holding the valve perfectly centered. And now you know what the culprit is and now you decide if it's, worth pulling the cylinder or not. But that's how that's kind of how we do the te detective work. So the oil analysis sort of gives us this early warning that says uh, you, you've got, a, you, you've got uh, an accelerated wear problem on an exhaust valve and it's time to pull out the bore scope and take a really good look. Now, um, both of those examples are, are, of course, with your hot section, your top, uh, would you, uh, do you see much in terms of, of information about Babbitt material and bearings and things like that that would ever show up there? Is that a sign as well? It it, it is. Um, although you know the, the, the bearings are, uh, it, it's 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 very rare to uh, for an engine to to have to be torn down because of a bearing problem. The bearings, as as long as as they as long as there's no systemic lubrication failure in the engine those bearings will last outlast pretty much everything else in the right. engine well um, you gave an example in the most recent article i know that i read from you about obviously oil starvation causing bearing to right right to that's that's, that, once that's 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 happening what, you're going right that, that that you're talking about the 421 accident mm. that we looked at and of course that that bearing, all of the all of the bearing material was extruded off that bearing, and and uh, uh, you know there's an enormous amount of, of, of bearing metal that that was liberated uh, uh, by by that event. Um, but but unfortunately, it was liberated between the time that the shop checked the oil filter and the time that the airplane crashed. So right. there wasn't a good chance to look for it. Um, now, you're obviously savvy maintenance provides a, a lot of consultative services that have to do with a lot of these types of questions, because I think, you know, the next 
logical question for everyone, and, and there's many questions that have come in that we, we won't be able to address directly here for individual folks, <laughs> but I mean, the, the, the logical questions are how do people as, as aircraft owners, not, not AMPs and IAs, how do they determine um, when something is acceptable, when it's not acceptable, what the, what the, uh, what's essentially going to happen based on a failure. As you noted, there's simple ones where I have two vacuum pumps. If I lose one, I've got another one in a wing locker. Um, <laughs> other cases, I think, are a little, you know, how much wear is okay on struts? When is it okay to, you know, that have just leaking bunch of things? Or the things get a little grayer for a lot of people. Um, uh, and, and so why don't you tell us a little bit about, A, how you make those decisions, and then B, the services that you provide directly so people can get your help making those decisions. Yeah, well, of course, we do a huge amount of that, Jeff. Um, uh, uh, we, we do a lot of, of helping people analyze, uh, figure out how to gather data and then analyze data. That You know, the, uh, to a very large extent, um, our, our, our business is, is focused in the diagnosis area because, you know, my experience with, with A&P mechanics in the field are, they're, they're sort of the surgeons of general aviation. You know, they take things apart um, and they're pretty good at doing it. Um, uh, diagnostic work is, is very different. Um, diagnostic work is, 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 consists of gathering data and then interpreting it. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the training in a &P school is not very good in that area, in my experience. And so that's a, an awful lot of what we do. And it, it's because it's based on data, we typically never even see the airplanes that we're dealing with. We just collect data and analyze it. And in today's wonderful world of knowledge projecting technologies where everybody has you know, a high resolution camera that is connected to the internet with them 24 seven and, and, and at least half the fleet have recording digital engine monitors uh, that, that are gathering all sorts of parameters uh, uh, every second or sometimes more than once a second. Um, uh, we, we, we have access to a tremendous amount of data. And, and now that, you know, a, a pretty, a, Pretty serviceable borescope is down to about 200 bucks. So everybody can afford to have a borescope. You know, there's no excuse not to have one. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing time right now in terms of revolutionizing the way diagnostic work is done. The, the, the remediation is still pretty much done the way it's always been done. You know, we, we, we use cylinder base wrenches and all that kind of yeah, stuff. but but the, the the way we do diagnostic stuff now, you know, John was talking about spark plugs and, and measuring resistance and bomb testers and stuff. And, I, you know, uh, my camera was off, so I couldn't jump in. But I was thinking, you know, that's the old way of doing things The the by far the best way to evaluate the condition of the ignition system is not with any of that stuff. It's in the air that we, we, you know, we, we ask our, our clients to do high power, very lean, preferably lean of peak in flight mag checks. And then we take a look at the data that that's gathered by doing that. And, and when we ask them to do mag checks, we ask them to, in flight to turn off the, you know, one mag and leave it off for a fairly long length of time. So we get a whole bunch of data samples. And it, and if the, if, if that, that that's putting the spark plug under the worst case conditions, much worse than you can ever do in the maintenance hangar. It's at high temperature. It's at high pressure. It's, it, you know, it's, 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 it's real life and it's like worst case real life. And then we can, we can look at the data and we can see whether the spark is, is, is igniting the mixture um, reliably on every cycle or whether it's starting to get erratic or not. Mm -hmm. We can see whether the um, w whether the uh, uh, the EGT rise is about the same on the left mag only and the right mag only, or if there's a difference. If there's a difference, it means the two mags aren't timed the same. Um, we can tell an, an enormous amount from it, and and uh, under 
you know, what I call it an ignition system stress test. It's a, it's a much more stressful test than anything you can do in the maintenance hangar. So we try really hard to train our clients that, you know, the, the way to diagnose stuff is in the air. You know, don't, don't put the airplane in the shop too soon. Because right. once you put it in the shop, some mechanic's going to start attacking it with tools, and now we can't gather data anymore. You know, right? right. So uh, awesome. we're we're really big at, tra at 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 trying to you know diagnose problem first. It's like if you have a if you have a tummy ache, you know you 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 don't want to go to a thoracic surgeon first. You know <laughs> that's kind of the last place you go. You may have to go say, there. Right? Surgeons cut. Right, um, um, but you know, the first thing you do is you is 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 you is you start you know running some tests and try to figure out what's wrong before you, you before you go to somebody with anything sharp in their hand, you know. And and yeah. it, our philosophy about aircraft maintenance is pretty much the same. We want to gather as much data as we can uh, be, before we 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 down the airplane and put it in a maintenance hangar. Well, I would love to uh, have a, a program with you dedicated towards what what happens during that stress test and how we learn about things during that. Because I think that. Oh, is you bet! I've got all sorts of graphics I can show you. Yeah, let's I'm let's have a this dedicated stuff. one that actually does that. And and even though we're over time a little bit, I I have to hit you with another little thing that's that's kind of my my personally uh, maintenance pet peeve and get some of your thoughts on. And that is, what are your thoughts on the 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 idea of a mechanics in the field that I think are get it seems are are getting less and less interested in being uh, real really practicing their craft and and being maintenance technicians to the level of opening components up doing things rather than pulling something off and sticking it in a box and UPS becomes their you know in and out of, of how components get dealt with. Right. Um, what what are your thoughts on on that? On when people can actually should be kind of opening and replacing an O-ring in something instead of putting it in the box and getting it overhauled only? Well, that I mean that triggers two different thoughts. First of all, you, you, the, this business about whether to whether to repair things or replace things. Um, it the Replacing things is often the best thing to do if um, the things you are replacing are are available on the shelf mm -hmm. and if dispatch um, getting the airplane back on the line is more important than what the maintenance bill is going to be. And that's typically the case in commercial operations, whether it's airlines, whether it's part 135. That, that's a working airplane. Um, and, and the top priority is to get that thing back in the air. Right. And if the and the quickest way to get it back in the air is to is to pull out the pull out the bad box and, and put a replacement box in. That's the right thing to do. For owner flown GA, it's a whole different situation um, be, because for for aircraft owners like like you and me probably, we're very sensitive to maintenance cost. And if we have the and, and and we're not as sensitive to 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 downtime as say an airline operation would be, or a charter uh, operation would be, or even maybe a flight school operation where where the airplane is earning is you know earning money. So for people like us, it's really worth you know taking stuff apart rather than that re rather than than uh, right. replacing it. Well, I mean, um, it, you know, it, it always matters. It's, there, there's always a line, right? And the cost of the mechanic counts and the cost of time right. counts. And, and it, it, so I, it's certainly something that's uh, going to be in the gray area. I think you, well, you there's, there's one lots other, of emails one other. people. I, I've seen people that aren't putting brushes in, in, in uh, alternators or send them off to right. get overhauled, that aren't using any of the kits that Tempest and, and through their, their companies sell to, to do anything having to do with the carburetor. Carburetor hiccups? We we completely send it out. We don't right. We don't well, convert. there's an, there's another reason for that, Jeff, and and this is this is really important for people to understand. Um, and and I wrote an article about this. It was called Liticophobia. Um, mechanics are terrified of liability. Uh, and and the terror increased pretty dramatically uh, in the mid 90s. 
um, when uh, the General Aviation Revitalization Act was passed by Congress. And that, that was the, the thing that, 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 that basically put an 18-year statute of repose on product liability for the manufacturers. Um, because lawsuits were absolutely killing the manufacturers. And Cessna basically said, you know, we're not going to build little airplanes anymore unless we can get some relief from this liability tail. So Congress passed GARA, and, but it didn't stop the lawsuits. What it did was it changed the defendants. Right. Because the, 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 big, the deep pocket manufacturers were now largely off the table, at least for aircraft that were over 18 years old, which represents the majority of our fleet. Lawsuits against component manufacturers, shops, mechanics skyrocketed. Yep. And, 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 and people started getting, I guess, justifiably paranoid. I suppose it's not really paranoid if somebody really is following you, but... Um, but but mechanics just started getting really paranoid about liability. And and so instead of fixing something where they are actually taking responsibility for the outcome, it, it, their their perception is that that we can shift the liability by sending the thing out or replacing it. Because now they're not vouching for the quality of it. Somebody else is vouching for the quality. Right. Of it. And I, and I, it's you know everybody in the medical profession is 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 aware of this thing called defensive medicine, where doctors will prescribe all sorts of tests that they wouldn't ever do if you were a member of their family. Right. But because they're concerned that if they miss anything, you might sue them. Uh, they go like way overboard, and th the same exact psychology is going on in 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 maintenance, and I call it defensive maintenance, where where mechanics do stuff that d d not really to benefit the aircraft owner, but to but to to cover their own behinds, and so and it's it's very pernicious, I think. So when, when people have, for example, your services, right, they're signed up for savvy maintenance and, and other things that help them uh, to kind of push back against some of this, do you find mm -hmm. that you, you spend much time on these types of topics where someone might say, I mean, I, again, I get the same emails from people trying to help people on things, but just not nearly the scale that you do, of course. And it's like, well, there's a couple drops of, of oil they thought they saw in, a, in, the, in the, the blast tube coming out of an alternator. and they just want that my mechanic wants to send and, and completely overhaul my alternator and it's only got 200 hours on it or 500, right. you know, like things that could be opened and maintained. Do you try to get local shops to do some of that instead of jumping? We were talking overhauls with engines, but let's talk overhauls with all these components from gearboxes to alternators to starters, you name it. Yeah. I mean, well, that's, that's a big part of, of, of what we do. And the, and you know, what we, what we're able to do is is um, by giving the shop specific marching orders in a way that most aircraft owners, you know, either don't have the experience or the chutzpah to do, um, we're essentially taking the liability off of their hands. We're saying, okay, look, we're 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 making the decision, and we're taking the responsibility for that decision. We're you you're just carrying out the marching orders that we gave you so nobody can blame you for it okay and you know in extreme cases and this doesn't happen very often but it happens a couple of times a year if we get crosswise with a shop where the shop wants is, is saying I, I'm not going to sign off this annual unless we do X and X is just ridiculous um, and we can't uh, and, and, and after using um, you, you know our best faith efforts to try to to come to a compromise. We'll just say fine. Let's agree to disagree. Sign off the annual as as unairworthy, and we'll take the airplane off your hands and take it to somebody else. Right. And we we do this a couple times a year if we if we run into if we you know run into some somebody that just is so dogmatic that that, that they won't you know listen to uh, yeah to to sense, but. You know, because no no mechanic has the right to hold an airplane hostage. I mean, every right. every every mechanic is entitled to their to their opinion, and we never expect somebody to sign off an airplane as air airworthy if they don't think it's airworthy. 
But and that brings if, up if, that if, brings if, up a if, really good point, right? Because so much of the work that you've done has been on uh, really it, kind of educating and defending the rights of aircraft owners in many cases who don't understand those rights, that don't always understand that an aircraft annual ends with an inspection completed and a list of discrepancies has been provided to the aircraft owner. Not airworthy, not airworthy, I'm letting the shop, I'm out of right. my shop, I'm signing it off, I'm not signing it off. That, I think that's I'm, one I of the mean, the, uh, you know, a good argument could be made, Jeff, uh, that that every annual should should end with a list of discrepancies. Every annual should be an, an airworthy sign off because there's no such thing as an airworthy airplane. You put an airplane in for an annual, nobody's ever going to say, "Hey, we looked and we looked and we looked, couldn't find anything wrong." You know that never happens, right? Um, but so you know, the, the, it, I'm, I'm in California, and s smog is a big was we used to be a big thing here, and so we have to get our our cars smog checked every every year too. There's two kinds of smog stations in California. There's the kind that just does the testing and gives you a report, and there's the kind that can fix what's wrong. Well, I'm always a little more comfortable going to the kind that tests and gives you a report because they don't have an ulterior motive to flunk you, you know. Right. Uh, and and it, it, in, a, in a way, it's, it's very confusing. Um, the, you know, you, we have these guys called IAs that, 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 that inspect things, and we've got these guys called A&Ps that fix things. But unfortunately, they're frequently the same guy, and they're, they're switching hats between their IA hat and their A&P hat. And and most mechanics don't have this really crisp notion that there's a boundary line there. You know that when they're inspecting, they're doing one thing, and then when they're fixing, they're doing another thing. And so the shops get into this inspect a little, fix a little kind of mode where there's never a good decision point for the aircraft owner, and then they you know they come up with these 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 invoices that that and 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 right. the aircraft owners get unhappy, and then they start fighting about the bill and so we try really hard to 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 put, you know, some sort of a a, a well-defined protocol in place to prevent that sort of thing from happening. That we we aren't gonna we're not gonna start fixing anything or ordering parts or anything until the inspection is complete. We've had a look at the discrepancy list. We've gone through the repair estimates. We've decided what things we want to approve, what things you want to decline, what estimates we want to question. And it's all done in a, in a sort of a some kind of a reasonably formal protocol, so that so so that the distinction between the inspection part and the fixing part is 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 maintained. Right. Well, um, Mike, I want to make sure uh, that that we get to the, the the last thing here for you uh, uh, with our time, and that is uh, you've done some uh, what I think is 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 a really great thing with uh, during the, the COVID-19 crisis, and that is making your uh, Savvy Breakdown service free uh, during this crisis. So uh, if you can tell us a little bit about that uh, before we go, that would be fantastic. Sure, well, um, um, a few years ago, we, we launched uh, this service called Savvy Breakdown. Um, uh, it, it, uh, this is something I'd wanted to do for years because it, it struck me as very strange that every category of owner operated motor vehicle other than airplanes ha had some sort of a breakdown assistance or roadside assistance service whether it was triple a for cars whether it was good sam club for rvs uh, boat us for boats there, there's even services for like snowmobiles and stuff you know but there wasn't any for 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 airplanes and you know there wasn't any for airplanes for a fairly good reason because it's harder for airplanes. There, there, there are two issues with airplanes that are different that make them different from other motor vehicles. One is you can't tow them. <laughs> most, <laughs> most, 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 you know, roadside assistance or breakdown assistance services are basically towing services. They they come get your vehicle and they move it to some place that can fix it. Well, you can't do that with airplanes. You pretty much have to deal with them where they sit. And the other thing about airplanes that makes it hard is that they're much more regulated than, than any other category of motor vehicle. But, you know, this is the kind of thing we'd been doing for our managed maintenance clients for years. And we thought, 
you know, somebody needs to make this available to, to GA. So we started this service some years ago, and we now got uh, oh, about 3,000 people who are, who are signed up, plus all, all, I guess all of our managed maintenance clients are eligible. So it's probably about 4,000 um, aircraft that we cover with, with uh, breakdown assistance. And we basically have a 24-7 toll-free number. Um, and uh, you call the number, uh, and you, you get a, an operator who was actually in, in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, I think. And, uh, and, and within 15 minutes, one of our IAs calls you back and starts walking through a diagnostic Q&A and, and to figure out what's wrong with the airplane. And um, about half the time when we go through the diagnostic procedure, we come to the conclusion that the problem is um, not a safety flight issue and it's okay to, to, to continue on or to fly home in that condition, deal with it later. The other half of the time, it, it is a problem and we have to go find whatever maintenance resources are necessary to get it, to get it fixed. And if the owner wants to stay with the airplane, that's fine. If the owner wants to continue his trip via alternate transportation, we, we take care of getting the airplane flyable again um, when it, whenever it gets back to it. Yep. So we've been doing this for, for a number of years. And um, then when the COVID thing hit, and um, it started to get really hard to get maintenance done on airplanes because a lot of the shops were closed. A lot of the mechanics are, you know, sheltering in place and so on. So we, we decided that at, for the duration of the lockdown, the, the end of which is still a little bit undefined. So we've not, I'm not sure how long we're going to do it, but certainly at least till the end of June or July. Uh, it, it, it may extend longer. It just depends on how things look. But we decided to, to open it up, make it free. Um, and also the, the, our breakdown service was limited to breakdowns that occurred um, more than 50 miles away from home base because it, it wasn't supposed to cover things that happened at home only when you right. were away. Right. But we, we've at least temporarily uh, eliminated that requirement again because so many shops are closed and so on. So um, for at least the next few months, uh, anybody who wants to, to, to sign up for it, um, it, you just go online, go to go to savvybreakdown.com, uh, give your contact information and the, some information about the airplane. We don't ask you for a credit card or anything like that. It's just you can enroll for the serv in the service. You get a, a toll free number to call if you've got a problem. And uh, and we're, we're doing this for free for at least the next several months until things start <laughs> returning towards some yeah. sense of normalcy which we hopefully will be back at soon but but certainly until then uh, i certainly appreciate everything that that you're doing uh people that want more information please contact savvy aviation mike i'd love to have you back to uh talk about some of those things like the in-flight stress test maybe some boris yeah. uh, you know we we, ne we didn't even talk about predictive maintenance we're doing some really exciting stuff with predictive maintenance uh, exactly that's I'd exactly like to talk why about we, that maybe we can do another session and talk about that stuff would love to i'm a, a huge fan of your work i know everybody else who came on is definitely of that as well john thank you so much as well coming to us with uh, um from tempest aero group um, would love to have some more things. We talked about fuel systems last week. We had an in-depth uh, webinar all on those uh, carbureted, uh, uh, carburetors and fuel injection systems, the RSA systems, and we'd love to do some more on those as well in the future and all the other products that you have. So again, thank you so much to both of you, and thank you to everyone for staying with us, for staying part of socialflight.com and also here at Social Flight Live. And until next time, Blue skies.